one of the kind of key findings, which which isn't a main finding, is because we didn't do a direct comparison. But what we did was we took our Ikigai average scores and compared it to the original average scores in the Japanese population. And we saw that there was no significant difference, which actually surprised us. We thought that people in the East, people from Japan would have a higher level of Ikigai than people in the UK for kind of obvious reasons in that these these cultural values are not taught to to people in Britain, at least Mm. not in such an explicit or implicit way, actually. That is Dr. Dean Fido of Derby University, and this is episode 12 of the Ikigai podcast. Find your Ikigai at ikigaitribe.com. In this episode of the Ikigai podcast, I'm speaking with Dr. Dean Fido, who has a doctor of philosophy in the field of cognitive neuroscience and currently lectures in criminal psychology at University of Derby in England. Dean, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Thank you for inviting me, Nick. Really exciting. Awesome. So we've just had a quick chat, but um, I guess... I should let the audience know how I, I stumbled upon your, your research paper, which is titled English Translation and Validation of the Ikigai 9 in a UK Sample. And we'll, we'll get into what the Ikigai 9 means shortly. But that's, that's something you co-authored with Yasuhiro Kotera and Kenichi Asano. Yes. And that was, was that your introduction to, to Ikigai? Yes, it it, uh, it very much was the the kind of the emphasis of Ikigai um, was introduced to me uh, by Yasuhiro, um, who who I always call Yasu, um, and his sort of main interests are analyzing to see how you can take concepts from Japan, where where he, he used to be based before moving to England, um, and seeing whether or not there is a direct translation or whether there's any sort of niche uh, differences. Uh, in the way in which these concepts and these lifestyles, you might say, ways of living, um, actually manifest in the West. It's, that's fantastic. It's comforting to know there there is someone like Yasu Hira and yourself putting some, um, I guess, r- real verifiable study into this because, as we know, Ikigai guys this greatly misunderstood concept um, that people sort of relate to entrepreneurship or finding your dream job. Um, mm. and, or purpose, and it certainly does relate to purpose, but it, it goes far deeper than that. So how would you define Ikigai? So I think that's actually, it, it sounds a very simple question, but I think um, in our research, that was the first sort of uh, stumbling block which we hit um, because I, when, when Yasu brought the term to me, I, I actually asked him, how he would define it, you know, because he he's obviously uh, Japanese and English speaking. And he even had to take a step back almost um, to kind of consider how he was going to um, portray that information to me. And and the first thing that he, he, he said to me was, it's almost um, your purpose in life or your reason for living. And then he started to to elaborate more on what it wasn't rather than what it was which was which for me was a really interesting way of trying to um talk about something which perhaps in the uk we've never spoken about before it's it's not something that we a term which obviously commonly comes up um and it's really interesting that you mentioned about kind of the um entrepreneurshipness Mm. um because that's one of the examples that he used in terms of actually what it's not yeah and i think that's quite a uh, a misdemeanor, really, which people fall into. Yeah, there's this idea: it's doing something you love, that you can, that you're good at, that the world needs, and that you can be paid for. Recently, I have seen a few people change that to what you can be rewarded for, because every Japanese I've met and I've shown that diagram to, they've said, "Oh no, you know, you guys, not about money. It's not about making money." That's probably an interesting way to, to approach it. Maybe say. Look, yeah, it's it is hard to find, uh, hard to translate or define, but it's we can start by saying what it's it's not. I, I learned that it's it's more about daily de- daily living, and it's not so much a goal to attain. And it's 
it can be more than one thing. So it's, I guess it's the things in life that, that make your life worth living. And there's also this, this idea, it's moving towards the future, feel, feeling that your life is moving towards a better future as well. Mm. So I'm, I'm still learning how to define it succinctly because it, it is a hard concept to ex- explain in a few sentences. Of course, and, and, and I kind of guess um, from, from our point of view as uh, social scientists, we, it's very important for us to try and um, almost objectify something and make it um, as measurable as possible yep. um, in order for us to conduct tests. And that is actually one of the problems that we faced in terms of, okay, so th- there's, there's a multitude of ways in which people have, have measured this, have, have measured the guy in the past. Um, what is the best one which is going to be uh, suitable for our purpose? And, and, and more importantly, which is the best one where if we wanted to draw direct comparisons uh, with Japanese culture, um, which, which one should we choose? Because cause we can't do everything. We can't just kind of cherry pick what works and what doesn't. We have to kind of uh, go in there with a, with a set goal and a set target. Um, yes. Okay. And so was that what you attempted to do with the, the Ikigai 9? Yeah, so we we did a quick uh, literature review of, um, well, I, I say we did it, uh, Yasu did it, because as you're probably aware, um, lots of the research to date before our paper was purely in, in Japanese. It's something that hadn't really been touched on um, in the West. And I think there's actually a, a portion of our paper which talks about, um, so, so normally in kind of psychological literature, we talk about previous research studies. And what we had to draw on was kind of um, articles in the news and kind of social media uh, from the West, which had started to talk about Ikigai. So we use that as a platform to say um, people are becoming aware of it, but actually there's no psychological um, and scientific underpinnings. Um, so when Yasu was conducting the, the literature review, there was a couple of sort of um, scales which came up that the Ikigai 9 uh, was one of them. Uh, there was a secondary scale uh, which we which we looked at, and the items um, didn't seem to click with kind of um, what Yasu had been brought up with. So it, it was it was almost as if they were very kind of uh, niche and perhaps didn't conceptualize Ikigai as as fully as it could have been. And um, there were there were also ones which were kind of um, very to the point, which um, well, when people were measuring Ikigai in kind of um, physical well-being studies, um, they were literally just asked, uh, do you experience Ikigai, yes or no? Uh, yeah, I which... think I stumbled upon that study. Yeah, it was something like that. It was either, do you have Ikigai in your life? Yes. Yes, yeah. that, 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 that is actually the wording, isn't it? Mm. Um, which Which we thought was really interesting because... From somebody who's likely to have been brought up in the culture and these are very kind of um, overt feelings or experiences that they have, that's a, that's a very good way of, 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 of capturing that. Um, however, there's kind of two problems with that. Uh, the first, which is the most obvious one, is that it doesn't really translate um, into English or other kind of Western languages or cultures um, because we first need to define what Ikigai is. Um, and, and the second one is that as, as a social scientist and somebody that kind of does lots of uh, criminolo- criminological research, I'm very much against putting people in boxes. So um, if, if we kind of go down the yes or no kind of dichotomy route, it's essentially saying, do you experience Ikigai? Yes or no. And suddenly we have two groups of people um, whereby personality traits, um, our kind of aversions to behaving in a certain way. Uh, They're very uh, situationally dependent. And especially in terms of personality traits, uh, we exist on a continuum a lot of the time. Okay, so we we may experience Ikigai, um, but only to a a smaller degree in certain situations, perhaps. So um, I I was very much against uh, going down and putting people into these kind of... um, pigeonholes I, I i did i didn't see it as a, a as a viable means sure yeah so i I've, i did my research and i i, I guess I'll, I'll provide a, a definition of the ikigai nine and then you can elaborate on it so it's a, mm. a psychometric tool that was published and and validated by uh japanese researchers tadanori imai 
Hisao Osada and Yoshitsugu Nishimura. So it was obviously a, a study or a tool that was already existed in Japan. Yes. And you and Yasu obviously thought, how can we can we can we use this? And obviously that was yes we can. Let's translate it and then do a study of I think over three hundred participants. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No. That's uh, that's kind of a, a perfect kind of uh, conceptualization of it. I, I, th- I think one of the key points to, to take home from that as well is that um, from our kind of it, it, it was a, it was a very brief literature review, um, as you can see from the paper, because there the, there just wasn't that much uh, existing literature. But what we saw is that the majority of the time. Um, Medical researchers in Japan were associating uh, the uh, ikigai measured by the ikigai nine or some other metrics with uh, physical health conditions and physical health outcomes, such as kind of uh, reduced experience of coronary heart disease, um, reduced behavioral exposure to uh, smoking and drinking alcohol, um, which which we thought was really interesting. Um, but as kind of social scientists, we're always looking for the, the underpinning mechanisms. So it, it's very rare that a, um, a personality trait directly relates to somebody's behavior or somebody's health. Um, and, and by that, what I mean is that if we kind of boil Ikigai down to um, have it, having a reason for being or, or, or wanting to, to live and carry on living or having a purpose for living, what, whatever... It, it doesn't matter which whichever way you want to kind of conceptualize it. Um, that in itself cannot account for your behavior 100% of the time. Sure. And so it, it's likely to be the kind of underpinning principles and um, the social circles that you're brought up in, the social influences of parents, um, elders, uh, family and friends, which has an impact on that behavior. So it, it's almost a it's almost a stepping stone rather than a direct association. Um, which led us to think, okay, so um, we, we, we know that kind of our mental health is a big precursor to our behavior as well. So on top of what's already been, doing, already been done in the kind of physical um, health world, can we A, replicate it in the UK and uh, B, add on this value of um, commonly discussed kind of mental health mm-hmm. conditions or, or feelings? Yeah. No, I, I did notice in in the paper that it's oh, it is ikigai is uh, defined as the, the Japanese construct of having purpose in life as a means of protecting against suicide, which which did surprise me because I'd never really I think I'd only seen that if, not many times, only a few times where ikigai was related to perhaps preventing um, depression and suicide. Mm. In this is you know, Japanese papers that I attempted to read. So that, that's, that's something I haven't really explored deeply. Is, is that something that you and, and Yasu discussed? Yeah, so... Um, I mean, those, the sorry, key... the, the whole mental no. health, yeah, the ment- when people think of men- mental health, it's generally this concept of d- depression... And now we have this new, I guess, phrase of positive psychology. Of course, of I, course. I think most people would relate ikigai to positive psychology. They wouldn't relate it to mental health. No, um, yes, that's and, right. and, that, and, and that, that's an extremely good point, actually. Um, and, and ironically, it's the antithesis of the way that we were going. So um, because this was the kind of um, first sort of Western, um, especially UK paper on ikigai, um, we wanted to frame the uh, the outcome measures, um, which were uh, general mental well-being, stress, anxiety, and depression. Um, and the reason that we chose those kind of four indicators is because that's what people, uh, lay people at least, and people that read media, social media, they're kind of buzzwords almost that people yeah. can buy into and people that understand. Um, whereas if we started talking about um, elements of positive uh, psychology such as uh, mental resilience or even physical resilience um, these are these are terms which are a more difficult to understand and b um, 
it's harder for lay people um, to kind of interact with our research. And, and one of the most important things for both Yasser and myself is that when we do any piece of research, um, we publish it uh, freely where possible. OK, so we, we, we make our research available to everyone and we make sure that we write it in a way where anyone uh, can pick it up. My, before I ever send a paper in to be published, I always send it to, uh, to my dad uh, to read it. And um, I, I, make him, I make him circle anything that he doesn't understand. Because for me as a researcher, if, um, if somebody doesn't understand something that's relatively small, um, then that kind of blocks their access to understanding the key take-homes of your research. So, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've actually developed an appreciation for um, people such as yourself who, who do a lot of research and then you, I guess you have this task where you, I guess there are rules about how you have to write and present your data and, and you have to cite the amount of citations in papers astound me there'll be mm. hundreds so there's a lot of research and you've got to verify everything and and fact check and then and then you've got to present it in a way that's yeah more more factual rather than well my opinion is this and i think ikigai could be a positive way to blah 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 you yeah, know we um we uh act- actually reached a very um, good milestone today. So um, I, I was talking about kind of uh, the way that we publish in terms of putting it in um, journals, which are more accessible to, to people. And uh, one of the downsides of being in academia is that there's always sort of a competing interest to publish in really high impact journals that kind of, kind of really high up scholars are going to be accessing. Um, but we chose um, to publish it freely and availably as well. And uh, today we reached our uh, 500th download of the oh, paper, nice. which, which to me, th- this just being out six or so months is actually really good because it's showing that people are reading it and it's not just scholars behind the paywall who are privileged enough to be able to access certain journals. So hopefully, you know, it, it is going to be having its true effect of bringing this concept uh, more widely to the West. Great. Well, I'll, I'll definitely, if it's okay, I'll definitely link to the papers on, on the of website course. so people can d- download it and read it themselves. So, so go, going back to the, the Ikigai 9, it, in the paper it's mentioned that it was proposed as a means of measuring Ikigai across three dimensions. Do you want yes. to introduce those three dimensions? So um, when, we, when we first uh, took the original paper, um, the Ikigai 9 started to be uh, divided into kind of subsections which encapsulated more of the sort of um, the effective, so, so the more emotional side of Ikigai and the more behavioral sides of, of Ikigai. Um, but when kind of Yasu and I uh, ran our own sort of data validation um, over the top of it, so, so essentially what we do in, in psychology and statistics as well, is we, we conduct something called a factor analysis, which essentially means that if I asked you um, 10 questions and they were all randomly distributed, uh, five of them asked about how happy you were and five of them asked about how um, sad you were. What this factor analysis does is it clusters those items into um, item pools which are asking about similar topics. So in the example that I gave you, you'd have two factors, one about happiness mm-hmm. uh, and one about sadness. And, um, and from what we saw in the original paper, um, these sort of independent components of the Ikigai 9 were proposed. However, it wasn't, it wasn't conducted in a sort of statistically viable way. It was more sort of the researchers having a look at the items and um, segregating uh, them off into item pools, which they thought were associated together and that and that's and that's perfectly fine it's perfectly viable however both Yasu and I are very stringent on our statistical means because sometimes even though things look different by eye statistically they're very similar Mm -hmm. and so when we got our data together and, and we ran our factor analysis on the UK sample what we saw is that actually there was very kind of strong coherence between all of the items which, which shocked us because this was the first sort of disparity between 
our data in Western populations versus the original data in, in the Japanese. Obviously, there's a couple of limitations there in that we conducted the statistical fact analysis and the original authors didn't. So because of that, we can't really tell whether there are true differences without having access to the original data, which sadly we don't. Um, but the kind of take home message is that um, no matter which way you kind of um, spread it or no, no matter which order you ask these questions, it seems that all of the questions in the Ikigai 9, at least in the UK sample, were tapping into the same concept. So everything was being asked about people's reasons for living, people's emphasis on wanting to kind of fulfill their life. So that's a really strong point is that we're measuring one holistic measure of Ikigai rather than lots of individual subcomponents. I see. Yeah. Well, we should probably introduce the the nine items. I, I, I kind of would, I guess as someone who's not a researcher, I, I would see them as statements. And then the participants yes. were asked to see to what degree each statement applied to them from one to five with one being does not apply to me and five applies to me a lot. So I'll, I'll just read out the nine statements. So they are, Mm -hmm. I believe that I have some impact on someone. My life is mentally rich and fulfilled. I am interested in many things. I feel that I am contributing to someone or to society. I would like to develop myself I often feel that I'm happy. I think that my existence is needed by something or someone. I would like to learn something new or start something. I have room in my mind. And I'm assuming that last one is room in my mind to think or contemplate or to. Yeah. So um, the, the last one, which you read out, um, the reason it's at the bottom of that list is that um, the way we've presented them in the paper is the degree to which they um, they strongly tap into Ikigai. Okay, so the, the first one being, I believe that I have some impact on someone and also my, my life is mentally rich and fulfilled. They very much, and as I'm sure from, from your research as well, they kind of epitomize what Ikigai is or how somebody might start framing their experiences of Ikigai. And as we go down the list, the statements become weaker, still valid, but weaker. And, and the last one, is, is something which caused quite a lot of contention, both at the translation stage and also in some of the new research, which I'll, I'll talk about later. So I have room in my mind very much taps into, I have the mental capacity to take on new things, to learn new things, et cetera, et cetera, to kind of add to society, to add to my life. But it, the, the purpose of the kind of translation was that it was a direct translation That's in both um, text and meaning. So, um, Yasu and uh, Kenichi, uh, they, they, they kind of cross-translated. Um, so one of them had a go at translating. Uh, the other one tried to retranslate it back into English. And then we looked at the disparities between the translations and really boiled those down in terms of both text and then meaning to make sure that the true impact came across. And the I have room in my mind, wh- wh- when that was said to me the first time, I really did have no idea what, what, what that meant. <laughs> So it, it, it took a little bit of back and forth, and, and that's what we settled on. And we've since talked to kind of other, other Japanese uh, co-authors on different projects. For them, they do understand what that means. But in UK samples, there is a little bit of disparity mm. because that, that, that could be taken in many different ways. And just as, a, just as a quick preview to some kind of research which we're doing in the future, we, we've recently undergone a, a validation of this in a in a Turkish population for reasons which I'll, I'll talk about later, and the same item came up again where the the Turkish translators also had difficulty and were translating it in a completely different way. So ideally, there is actually scope for removing that item from the questionnaire. I see. It, it, it wouldn't have any sort of meaningful impact on the data, but it it does mean that the Ikigai nine would then become the Ikigai eight. Okay, eight. <laughs> now it did stand out for me and I, I, I mean, I lived in Japan for 10 years, so I, I think I kind of knew what it meant, but I, at the same time I was thinking, okay, that's, that's interesting how that's been translated because it's not as specific as, as the others. It's could, mm, could be yes. open to interpretation, but I thought that was interesting. 
And so just to get clarity on the the five responses people had, there was one does not apply to me and, and five applies to me a lot. And then I guess two, three and four were... They're open to interpretation. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you, if you say three is is more or less a neutral response, okay? Yep. So it, it sometimes does and sometimes does not apply to me. And then two and four are the kind of intermediary responses, okay? So So it's like some of the time it applies to me or it applies to me, but not much of the time. So, so it's, it's sort of on a kind of percentageal degree, I guess. Of interest, we, we didn't have too many responses in the sort of one and five brackets. Right, I see. We, 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 which is quite interesting because it, it does show that people actually do have these senses of feelings, but perhaps they're not entirely sure how to express it. They certainly don't have it all of the time. Uh, but they do recognize that it is there in the background. Yep. One thing that I kind of like to do in terms of other scales that I've developed in the past is actually expand that one to five to more of a, a one to seven mm-hmm. uh, because it kind of gives that extra extra degree of uncertainty, but also it kind of positions people to, 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 to be more truthful in their responses, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it must be hard doing these these requests for people to participate. And I guess you, you hope that they're not overly happy or overly sad on the day, and the, you know, they're yeah. they're in a, a good they're in a good objective frame of mind. We can actually put a pin in that because we did get some findings which we were a little bit unsure about, and actually is is that kind of emotional state which we which we use to explain some of those findings and, and, and actually want to do research on in the, in the future in order to actually see whether or not that that state of emotion and um, can actually play a part in your mm. in your responses okay the objectives were to translate the ikigai 9 into english and that that included a, a back translation to to validate mm-hmm. the ikigai 9 in an english speaking sample and then delineate associations between ikigai and state measures of uh, mental well-being, depression, anxiety, and stress. So, obviously, you you achieved the, the first two. Yes. Did you think you achieved the, the third? So, so in terms of the third, just for the kind of uh, listeners' benefit, I, I can very like shortly boil down the key findings. So, so what we what we tried to do was just do direct associations between ikigai and measures of general uh, mental well-being, depression, anxiety, and and stress. And and what we kind of hypothesized was that if ikigai or the sensations and the feelings of ikigai was a sort of a master lock almost to very functional uh, mental well-being, then we should see positive associations with good mental well-being and negative associations with feelings of stress, anxiety, and depression. And what the results indicated was that the their scores on Ikigai 9 had a very high predictability of strong mental well-being, which was great, and low scores on measures of depression, which is, which is also great. Okay. The interesting findings, however, is that we didn't find any associations between stress and anxiety mm-hmm. uh, with the ikigai nine which which was quite unexpected okay it's 50 50 mm. yeah yeah so why do you think that's so like it, it sounds like okay ikigai is, is if you if you find ikigai in your life or you develop ikigai it can help with depression and it obviously has all these positive psychological benefits but you're, you're saying from the research from what we can tell it it's not going to help with anxiety and stress is that because anxiety or stress is usually related to specific things in life, meeting people, presenting, whereas depression, it's very hard to find the cause and sometimes there, there can be no cause? Yeah, so, um, so, so I, would, I would say that's a, that's, that's a perfect uh, summation. So, so if we go and take that, uh, if we go and take that hypo- hypothetical pin out of the wall that we talked about earlier, we, we was very happy with the relationship between positive uh, mental well-being because it's almost as if it's like this resilient factor. And we really did expect the negative association with depression due to the previous literature regarding ikigai and, and, and suicide completion. 
because as we know, uh, depression is a, is a huge precursor to, to suicide completion, sadly, and, and suicide attempts and suicide ideation. And, and the way in which we kind of describe these conflicting results with uh, anxiety and stress is that depression seems to be more of a, um, a, a larger, more noticeable uh, state in which somebody is in. Okay, so the, the common sort of qualitative feelings um, of depression are are more than sort of negative thoughts, but they're also physical responses, okay, that people, yep. people get fatigued, people um, can, can, feel their, can feel their heart and they can feel this overwhelming sadness. But whereas, yes, that can manifest in anxiety and stress, but in the, in the West, you know, people are anxious and people are stressed all of the time. time um, and yeah. people have such conflicting and demanding work schedules, which put them under immense stress where they're working uh, day in and day out, day out just to complete um, their contracted hours. People have hectic lifestyles where they might be, uh, might be a single parent or they might be a parent in a, in, a, in a kind of dual relationship, but they've got to work and then they've got to look after kids and then they've got to clean and make food. So people are constantly stressed. And so that could account for some of this variation. And then that's why it's really important that we very much um, in future research control the baseline situations that uh, that people are in. And that's uh, that's a lot harder to, to do than it kind of is just by saying it, because what's stressful for you might not be stressful for me, which might not be stressful for somebody else. Yeah. So it, so it's almost kind of like we need this this isolated vacuum to, to thoroughly uh, test this. But no, it, it, it was it was really interesting, and, and especially because the the measures of uh, depression, anxiety, and stress that we used are all sort of validated measures which have been around for years and years and years. And so we have we have very um, high faith that they are true uh, true recordings and true results. I think they do because if we if we look at the difference between um, I guess depression and and stress and anxiety at some stage in our lives most people will experience some form of depression. Hmm. But definitely in our lives, on a regular basis, we're going to experience anxiety and stress um, just because the way we live. If we, if we take on a new project or decide we're going to quit our job and, and find another job, that whole process of finding another job and doing hundreds of things for the first time you'll definitely have stress and anxiety about a particular experience that you haven't done before or that's challenging. Of course, yeah. I think it's normal for us to have stress and anxiety, but depression is something we, I guess we can accept that we, we will experience, but we shouldn't be depressed for months or years on end. Of of, of course. And and at least, at least with um, hope not in, in fact, we had planned to start our kind of latest projects about a month or two ago. But as soon as the whole kind of COVID-19 saga started, we've, we've actually halted a lot. In fact, the majority of our research on, uh, on mental well-being. I'm doing some research at the minute about uh, nature connectedness. So how kind of entwined you feel with nature and also mental health. We've put we've put a stop to that work just because we we recognise that we're in a situation at the minute which is really unique, whereby mm. people might not realise it, but people are very stressed at the minute in that people are adapting to new ways of life. And I mean, we we spoke uh, before before we started filming about how people have had to adapt to working from home, and I've, I'm I, I haven't got any children my, myself, but I, I can't imagine trying to do my nine to five job whilst having little little children running around you know yeah it was funny the first thing I said to my son this morning wasn't even good morning it was I've got a podcast at nine so <laughs> so yeah you're right I was stressed oh will he you know will the family be out the door so I can do this interview and then I kind of realized oh god I didn't even say good morning so I should say yeah say good morning first but yeah we're on this heightened level of um stress or anxiety and I've made the decision not to you know I haven't done a specific podcast on you know COVID-19 and and how to get through it because I think everyone's talking about it 
but part of me has thought that, you know, the, this experience we're all going through does give us the opportunity to re- reflect on what's really important. And I guess a lot of people oh, of are course. finding out what, what is important. And I, I think for many people would be the, their social life that, you know, they can't see their friends. They, they can't go see their fam, you know, family members. They can't take mm. trips interstate or overseas um, we were we were going to Japan this month, and obviously we can't do that. It's actually really interesting you say that because um, I did a I did a radio interview for for our local radio station uh, two weeks ago now. Um, I'm a I'm actually I'm, I'm a big advocate of social media use. I use social media. I use computers all the time. There's there's lots of research at the minute which sort of talks about social media addiction and why people um, use social media and the negative potential values of using social media. We, we recently just published some research called, it's a scale called the OFAQ, which is the Offline Friendship Addiction Questionnaire. And essentially what this scale does is it takes all of the items which are normally asked, all the statements about your addiction to Facebook or your addiction to social media, and it simply, re- it simply replaces those with the word friends. Okay, so for example, um, do you feel stressed when you don't talk to your friends on a daily basis rather than use Facebook on a daily basis? What, what we found is that using the same measurements that um, addiction researchers used, we found that 69% of our um, sample were supposedly addicted to their friends. Which oh. is obviously uh, it, it's obviously that's, that's, something which doesn't exist, um, but essentially what, what what we showed is that it's all it's all down to measurements and the way in which people conceptualize and measure things, and and in fact, this this social um, social media use is just us wanting to connect with people, and it's so important. And I think especially now that we're all in lockdown and we're all indoors, I've been able to connect with people who live in. I mean, well, we we're talking to each other now across across time zones half the way across the world and and that's and that's a thing of beauty and that's something which we shouldn't be uh, condemning it's something which we should be kind of proliferating i think yeah i agree no i agree so so going back to i just want to summarize the the results and i think we touched on them that you you've discovered ikigai is something you've verified that it's helpful in the sense of positive psychology. So optimism, um, making, I guess, making the most out of opportunities, um, Mm. enjoying life, understanding what you value and it, it can help with uh, depression and perhaps prevent suicide, but it it sounds like it can't help with um, anxiety and stress, which we, guess if if we look at it, it it sort of makes sense so my 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 question is is it a solution to mental illness so that's that that's very much <laughs> the important question that that it no and and that and that is a that's a really valid and serious question one of the kind of key findings which which isn't a main finding is because we didn't do a direct comparison but what we did was we took our ikigai average scores and compared it to the original average scores in the Japanese population. And we saw that there was no significant difference, which actually surprised us. We thought that people in the East, people from Japan would have a higher level of Ikigai than people in the UK for kind of obvious reasons in that these, these cultural values are not taught to, to people in Britain, at least mm. not in such an explicit or implicit way, actually. So, so that was actually a key finding. And and what we're doing at the minute is trying to come, we're we're collecting new data to directly compare because because obviously there was, there was about 10 years difference between these two studies. So we want to compare it in the here and now. What we're also looking to do is, and the important take home is that this is all correlational data. So even though we've controlled for um, people's gender or sex and also their age, because obviously your, your life experience and the older you get um, has an impact on, on your, your wanting to live and fulfill your life. And um, so, so we controlled for all that. But at the end of the day, these are just associations and they might be explained by, by other things. Okay, so it, it might be that Ikigai is just underpinned by a general positive personality. Um, and, and, we, and we don't know. We, we, we just don't know with the data that we have. So what we do want to do is conduct interventional research 
in order to see whether those interventions reduce our levels of depression, stress and anxiety. Because it's important to know that even though there's no sort of relationship within this study between ikigai and stress, it doesn't mean that one can't impact the other. It just means that there's no sort of association at baseline. So yes, so we're looking at a couple of ways in which we can do these interventions. And because there's there's, what, what we kind of know is that people, you can't really intervene with pure knowledge. Pure knowledge doesn't ever kind of help because because people take knowledge in, but they don't know what to do with that knowledge. So if we were to develop a a book, perhaps, mm-hmm. and just teach or a lecture or, or or even a podcast, if we was to give this podcast to, to people, they might think, yeah, that's that's really interesting, and I've learned something, and I'm going to go and give Nick a follow on social media. But it might not directly impact their depression, stress, anxiety, mental well being, et cetera, et cetera. So two avenues that we're, we're, we're going down is one is typically called uh, three good things. It's used a lot in, in uh, nature connectedness research or general kind of positive psychology in which people go out and um, they either walk around kind of a, a nature reserve and, and recognize three positive things about nature, such as I really like the way that the wind felt on my skin, or I, I like the smell, or I like the look of that flower. And what we've shown in previous research is that increases being intertwined with nature and also it increases their, their well-being if they recognize good things in life. Mm. Okay, So I, I really appreciate my family and friends. I um, I really had a positive day today. I had some really great experiences, and this is what I've learned from that. So what what one of our studies is, is for people to recognize uh, three good things in their life. So what, what the idea is that for, for the space of two weeks, every day people write down three very positive things that either happened in, in that day or that they reflect on in their life or their goals or ambitions. And what we want them to do is that past research has found that if you write things down or you say them out loud or you reiterate to them to yourself, yeah, um, that becomes internalized and actually becomes a part of your psyche almost, which might relate to, to mental well-being or relate to behavior. We are quite optimistic about that as, as an intervention. What we want to do is measure before and after the two-week period, uh, but also three and six months down the road. And the benefit of that would be that, yes, it's great if you can uh, decrease your depression in two weeks, but is that two weeks self-education enough to make that decrease in depression stable or will it come back? Okay. Um, and, and, and if it does come back, do you have to do more ikigai training perhaps? Mm. The, the second intervention is where we're bringing in a, a lady called Dr. Gujangarit and her speciality is in laughter psychology. Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's a very, very interesting world. And whenever she gives a, a presentation, everybody laughs for an hour. Like she's telling jokes, she's getting people involved. And you do have these positive benefits afterwards. And what we propose is to develop a program whereby this laughter therapy is entwined with life meanings and life goals and reflecting on yourself. And whether that's a more of a sort of an, a more impactful and intertwined way of kind of internalizing Ikigai rather than just reflecting on your life in, in more of a diary format. Sorry to interrupt, but I no. never ever factored in laughter to Ikigai. What you mentioned before, the, the, the three things, that's something that Ken, Ken Moggy, who wrote the book, uh, The Little Book of Ikigai, so he touches on the joy of little things. This, this aspect of appreciating just small things, and he, he has five pillars of Ikigai, but one, one is the joy of little things, and another one is to be in the here and now, and I, I think you, you, know, you can't appreciate the the joy of other things without being in the here and now. I think you, you need to be present to appreciate life more. Of course. And I guess life satisfaction is what, what we could say is, is something that we, we, we want to try and feel throughout the day as, as long as possible. And if we're fortunate, every now and then, yeah, we have these fleeting moments where something happens where it, it makes us laugh or smile. Mm, yeah. But to try and pursue happiness and be happy all the time is just unrealistic. Ikigai has become 
a massive sort of endeavor for me to, to understand, to share and to continually research so uh, i'll definitely look into ikigai and laughter and um, yes no we're, we're, we're excited to conduct the uh we're excited to conduct the research actually it's, it's going to be fun anyway <laughs> yeah so we should touch on um, we've already touched on that so you you obviously um are going to you've got a, a hopefully a book that you're wanting to write this year you've, you've just mentioned ikigai and and laughter and i think you were talking about another a study yeah so um we we, we kind of wanted to do a um, an east meets west uh, study. We we okay. was contacted uh, by some researchers in uh, Turkey and also Cyprus who who were interested in our research and wanted to know whether or not they could contribute in any way. We 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 never really thought about it before, but when we was conceptualizing the current research studies, um, our interest was okay. So we've got these um, eastern values, and then a direct comparison uh, to the west, specifically in the UK. Um, but what about countries who are both uh, logistically and kind of um, um, cognizantly um, situated in the middle? Okay, so so Turkey, Cyprus, because both of those culturally are influenced by both the East and the West. So we wanted to know whether or not, when we do do our direct comparisons uh, between uh, Japan and the UK, whether there are any sort of niche differences mm. um, in these countries in between particularly in in turkey so so the research is kind of ongoing the data is being collected in the background the the individuals that are helping us in turkey they're also medical practitioners and so that's opening us up to a world whereby we can start to develop our expertise in terms of ikigai and physical well-being as well um which is really important because it it, it goes back to the original ikigai research about the kind of uh, cardiovascular health um uh, because I, th- I think we mentioned it in the in the paper as well that uh, the UK's uh, National Health Service guidelines are looking to prioritise uh, cardiovascular health um, over the next ten years in the UK, and I, th- I think they had the aim of preventing 150,000 heart attacks, which would be huge. Yes. Um, and so, if we can in any way relate ikigai to physical well-being in the UK, um, that would be great. And also, if any of these interventions help to reduce the likelihood of uh, cardiovascular disease, that would that would not only give us great knowledge implications, but actually physical well-being implications, and we could actually help people. Which, behind every good research, is is the true aim. I see. So, so yeah. Um, what, so, what started off as a very sort of project of interest between Yasu and I, who, who first brought the idea to me. Um, could actually be really timely, especially in terms of UK policy. Okay. Oh, yeah. that's, that's fantastic. Ikigai is, to me, it sounds like it's, it's a solution for mental health, physical health, and life satisfaction. And I'm, I'm learning more and more about it as I interview people and, and, and do my own research. So I would definitely love to have you come back on once you've completed more of these studies and when you've I know writing a book can take a long time so mm-hmm. ho- hopefully yes. that'll be done um this year yeah and- so, so we um, we're, we're in contact with um so what we've essentially done is Yasser and I have invited people from uh, medical professions from sporting professions and um, from general kind of positive psychology um it, it's, it's not going to be a book say on on research but it's going to be more of a book on trying to understand Dickie Guy in uh, from certain different professions and from certain perspectives and almost generating a, a series of hypotheses which we can then go out into the research realm and, and test and see whether or not we can bring about change or improvements across different aspects of the world. That'd be great. And I, I do say this with some hesitation, so I don't want to offend anyone, but the, a lot of the books published on Ikigai, they're really just interpretations um, and they don't, they're, they're either about um, longevity and, and Okinawan lifestyles and um, mm. someone's interpretation. Very few books really do touch on what Ikigai is. So if another book is, is done with research and actually answers, um, you know, the question, what is Ikigai and how can we use it, um, that would be certainly one of the first people to, re- to read it. And, uh, yeah, as I said, I'd love to have you back on to 
to promote it and, and share it with the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, we really appreciate that. Yeah, so thank you um, so much for your, your time today, uh, Dean. And, yeah, let's, let's do this again. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't have to wait till you've completed a research. We can certainly um, do this again once you've learnt more about Ikigai and progress with your research. Perfect. Sounds great. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Ikigai podcast. To download Ikigai worksheets, to take the Ikigai questionnaire, or to join the Ikigai tribe, please visit ikigaitribe.com.